So I've been talking um, a lot over the, the past two days about uh, norms of uh, belief. But of course, um, what norms it's uh, appropriate to uh, judge belief by depends on uh, what kind of state belief is. And there's a lot of debate about that matter of, of quite a relevant kind. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, there's a, a very uh, strong Bayesian tradition in formal epistemology, <coughs> dear, oh dear. Um, where, where people are, are taking it that the, the, the really uh, fundamental kind of uh, cognitive state that we have to, to deal with uh, is uh, credence, uh, something like a degree of uh, belief, um, where credences are usually thought of as supposed to um, be structured in something like the, uh, the way that um, mathematical uh, probability is, is meant to be uh, structured. And, and if one thinks of uh, belief in, in that way, then the kind of norms that are appropriate would seem like very different from the ones um, that, that you would expect. If, if you thought about uh, belief in the way that's uh, more traditional in the epistemological uh, tradition, um, where um, belief is, well, it's often, when people explain what they have in mind, they often say uh, outright belief or uh, full belief, uh, which is, is thought of as some kind of um, binary uh, simply on, off sort of uh, state. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to spend some time today and uh, tomorrow uh, discussing some of these um, issues, um, both from an epistemological point of view and to some extent from a uh, a semantic uh, point of view as uh, well. I think there's also a, a lot that can be uh, said about them from a more psychological point of view or a po point of view of cognitive science, which I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to say very much uh, about, but I, I, I'm not, I don't want to dismiss its uh, relevance. Um, but, um, but to some extent, I'm, I'm going to be talking about, as it were, how how we actually tend to uh, think of be belief um, in when we when we're speaking in, in ordinary language uh, terms, but I don't. I mean, I don't think that that's the only important issue. I mean, I do think that that fundamentally we're co we're also concerned with what kind of states uh, people are actually in. Um, so. It, in the, in the case of the credences, which um, many people think of as, a, as well as a more scientific way of um, thinking about belief, um, I mean, I think some of that is a bit spurious. It's just because, as it were, it kind of looks more like science as soon as you're um, assigning numbers. Um, and of course, the question is where these numbers come from, and and on what, how solid a basis uh, they're actually being uh, as assigned. Um, but it, but w with with the theory of credences, we do we do have quite a number of uh, constraints, both of um, internal uh, consistency, and also in uh, relation to uh, action. Uh, and and so I mean you know it, going back to um, to Ramsey, there's the the idea that that we can actually measure uh, someone's uh, degrees of belief by what sorts of 
betting behavior they're willing to go in for, what bet bets they'll accept, at least on the assumption that, the, that they're uh, rational. Um, and so there's, there's a kind of operational test uh, for, for credence, which um, seems to put it on a, uh, a, a more solid scientific footing. Oh. Of course, I mean, practically all operational tests are, are fallible. I mean, we, we, I don't th think we would any more regard them as somehow uh, scientific definitions of what we're talking about. Um, and in the case of uh, degrees of belief, it, it, it's, of course, partly that uh, if, if someone is, uh, is not very rational, then, then the, the, the bets that they're willing to uh, take on are, um, are not going to be a very useful guide to the rest of the, their behavior and, and maybe not tell us very much about um, the, as it were, un, underlying uh, um, psychological states. Um, it, it, of course, you can, and you can also have, you know, let, let, for example, someone who, um, who, who refuses to make any bets b b for, b out of some religious principle. Um, and, um, and, you know, we could, we could talk about, well, what, what bets would they have if they didn't have this religious principle? But if they didn't have this religious principle, their degrees of belief would be different anyway. So, uh, so we can't use those hypotheticals um, in order to, uh, to measure their actual degrees of belief. But nevertheless, I mean, it, it, it's not unreasonable to, to think that uh, tests like betting behavior are some kind of useful uh, but fallible um, objective constraint on the assignment of degrees uh, of belief. And I think many, many people in, in that tradition uh, think of a talk of outright or full belief as just a very, very crude, coarse-grained way of talking about something like high credence. Um, and think that that's a, a more a more scientific approach to epistemology should, should be done in terms of uh, credences rather than uh, beliefs. I mean, it's the thesis that um, at least for rational agents that we can identify uh, as it was so-called full or outright belief with simply high credence in the given proposition. I mean, that's sometimes called the Lockean uh, thesis. So I want to, to raise uh, some questions uh, about that. And, and I mean, the general direction that, that I'll be going in over the next two days is a, a defense of the idea of uh, outright uh, belief as something that is not reducible to, uh, to degree of belief and as something that it actually it does correspond to the way uh, that, that we talk about uh, belief in, in natural language um, and that also has a strong relation uh, with uh, knowledge, uh, strong normative. Uh, and constitutive relation with knowledge. So to, to get started on this, I, I've, I want to discuss uh, a couple of uh, cases. Um, so the, the first of these is the one called uh, 10,000 uh, tickets on the handout. And so I'll, I'll just read that out so, so that we've got it uh, there in, in our minds. So, so this case, um, is where the character Lottie, of course the name is meant to remind you of lottery, uh, no, Lottie knows that there are 10,000 tickets in a fair lottery and only one will win. It's a standard lottery case. She cautiously refrains from forming a belief either way as to whether her ticket will lose. Um, she's just got one ticket in the lottery. Nevertheless, she knows and believes that its chance of losing is 0.9999 
four nines. She, and she makes bets on that basis. Thus, by an operational standard, her credence that her ticket will lose is uh, 0.9999. But in fact, her ticket wins. Um, so the, the, the point of, of this example is that uh, Lottie has an extremely high credence that her ticket will lose. And so if we just thought of um, belief, so unqualified, as uh, having a high credence in the given proposition, then she would count as uh, believing that the ticket uh, will lose. And at the same time, as we're judging by her behavior, we're going to say that she, she does uh, believe that the ticket will, will lose. Um, sorry, that she, does, she does have a high credence that, that the, the ticket will, will lose. And so on the Lockean view, the, uh, she believes it. And I mean, the point of the example is that just in virtue of having uh, beliefs about um, about probabilities, she could, she satisfies the the normal tests for uh, high credence. We do, I said, well, we don't need to attribute anything further to her for that. Um, but the the key normative, if you like, a point about the uh, example is that. This does not seem to be an example where Lottie is making any mistake at all. She doesn't seem to be in error about anything. But if we attribute to her on this basis um, a belief that her ticket will lose because she has a high credence by, uh, that her ticket will lose, then it seems that she, she would be making a mistake because, in fact, her ticket will win. Right? Um, so the, as we're trying to reduce uh, full belief to uh, high credence in this case, seems to be delivering an, a, a a mistaken account of the uh, of Lottie's normative status it, it should, because it attributes a mistake to her, which it seems that uh, she she isn't making. I mean, of course, uh, somebody could could say that um, the that the case is somehow incoherent, just doesn't make any sense. But um, I, I take it that it's a, 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 an example that we can quite readily understand. We can we can see how somebody could be in the very uh, cognitive uh, state that it uh, that it describes. Um, there's nothing inconsistent about this uh, description. I mean, beliefs about probabilities are one thing, and beliefs about what will in fact happen are something uh, different. And and so this is a this is a case that uh, seems to show that that belief is something different from even uh, very high uh, credence. I just I can't re resist m mentioning um, to the, a discussion I once had with a, a, a theoretical uh, a economist. It was actually about epistemic logic, and I, I was making some point about how um, some of the, the principles of epistemic logic that uh, economists uh, like to assume, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about this on Friday, um, actually seem to, to break down it just in very straightforward uh, cases of, of false belief. And, uh, and he said, yeah, false belief, that's, that's something that if we economists don't really have a way of modeling. <laughs> and that, I mean, <laughs> 
So he, he was talking as if false belief was some kind of very subtle thing that you know some philosophers had noticed, um, but th that you know was too uh, kind of too rarefied for uh, economists to to need to <laughs> to take any account of. And he and you know he was talking um, about uh, about economists. I mean, very theoretically sophisticated economists who who would certainly uh, have lots of. Uh, Bayesian models uh, with various degrees uh, of of belief, um, and um, and they also were also using epistemic logic, but in terms of of knowledge rather than belief. And so, of course, you can't you can't have false knowledge. And so, it, I mean, and I think he was the, the, the just the just isn't within the, the, that framework. Um, a, 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 any natural notion of false belief. I mean, the, the, there's. Um, there's really just, I mean, you, I mean, there's a notion of giving a, a, a high probability to a false proposition. But I mean, as the case of Lottie illustrates, I mean, you can, you can, I mean, you, you can know that uh, a certain proposition uh, is very uh, probable um, and, and still not be uh, making any mistake because, uh, because, um, not everything that's very probable actually occurs, uh, and so I think, in a way, he was he was recognizing something uh, about the the kinds of uh, epistemic models that economists were very often using. But a very striking fact that they actually um, don't leave room for uh, for false belief. Um, I mean, some people would, would draw very dark conclusions about economics from, from that. I mean, I, 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 myself, I think it, it's interesting how, how much good work that can be done without really taking a, a kind of false belief, but it's surely something that we do in the end need to, to, to take account of. Um, so one, one thing that I would like to do now is just to extend this from the notion of very high uh, probability to to the, the notion of, to probability one, um, because you might think that the trouble with um, identifying full belief with uh, high probability is is that really the the only thing that somehow counts as um, as outright belief would be, would be assigning something probability one, um, but. In fact, one can give an extension of the argument that that shows that the problem arises even for an identification of uh, full or outright belief with uh, credence one. Um, and the I mean the, the underlying mathematical fact here is that w once, once you're working um, with the infinite uh, probability spaces, you, you, ca you cannot expect that probability one will entail truth, that uh, prob prob probability one is not, in fact, the same as certainty. <laughs> um, mathematic. I mean, there are m mathematical reasons uh, for this. So. Um, <laughs> The, the, the case is this, Indira knows that there will be an omega sequence, uh, so that's an infinite uh, sequence ordered like the natural numbers, uh, not one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 um, of independent tosses of a fair coin. She cautiously refrains from forming a belief either way as to whether tails will come up at least once. Nevertheless, she knows and believes that the chance of tails coming up at least once is one, and she makes bets on that basis. Thus, by an operational standard, her credence that tails will come up at least once is one. Um, in fact, heads comes up every time. So th this, this really uh, has the, the same sort of structure um, as the previous case, except that we're dealing with probability one rather than a, an, an, an extremely high probability short of one. And th let, I'll just explain, well, I mean, it's kind of obvious if you just think in terms of standard real numbers, 
why, why the probability of, of an infinite sequence of heads has to be uh, one, which, which is that, I mean, the probability of, of heads once is a half, or the probability of heads twice is a quarter, the probability of heads three times is an eighth, and the, uh, the limit of that sequence is obviously uh, zero. Um, a, a slightly more interesting fact is uh, David Lewis, for example, thought that you could handle examples like that by um, using non-standard real numbers, so infinitesimals, for, of which there's now a consistent uh, theory, un unlike the way they were used in the 18th century. Um, and and that, that, so that, that, as it were, there could be uh, a, a number, an infinitesimal number which is smaller than all the, the these positive the numbers in the sequence but but still larger than zero and um and so that that you could somehow you could avoid giving probability one um to the, the um to heads uh so sorry to tails coming up at least once by by using infinitesimals but um in fact if you if you work it through you you realize um that that given the kind of um, symmetry uh, conditions on this example, where the, I mean, the sequence of infinitely many heads um, is it basically has exactly the same structure as uh, a finite, as a, so, sorry, as a, the subsequence where you knock off the first toss. I mean, if you just look at all the tosses from the second toss onwards, that's a sequence with exactly the same structure as the one that you started with. And it's, so it's, it's uh, the probability of getting heads in, in that subsequence should be half the probability of getting them in the overall s sequence. But because they're isomorphic, they should also be the same thing as probability. And, you could, and even if you allow for infinitesimals, the, the, the only way you can solve that equation of you know, x equals a half times x is by uh, having x equals zero. So even, even if probabilities are allowed as an option, you, it, it turns out you have to give probability zero uh, to the, an infinite sequence of heads if you're going to satisfy these uh, kind of natural um, constraints. Um, so at, just as with the case of Lottie, we, we, we don't want to say that Indira is making a mistake here, um, because what she what she's believing is just what she uh, the, st the stuff that she knows about the probabilities. You know, so it's just it's just knowledge, and you know, and so she's not making any mistake. Um, and and yet, if we if we said that um, a, a, a credence one judged by the operational standard uh, implied um, full belief, then we'd have to say that she had a full uh, belief that, uh, that tails uh, will come, come up at least once. Um, and I mean, if you, if you think about the, the underlying sort of mathematical structure here, you can, you can see that there is a, a real difference uh, between um, between just uh, outright uh, belief, um, uh, uh, as it would be modelled ma mathematically, and and probability um, it, one, or correspondingly belief that outright belief that something won't happen, and probability uh, zero, um, because I mean, the, the, the underlying mathematics has a, a sort of possibility space of, uh, um, which, which you can, in effect, think of as a space of, uh, of possible worlds. Um, and uh, simply excluding a proposition um, means having no worlds in the space where that proposition is true. Whereas um, giving that proposition probability zero is just assigning a, a measure of zero to the set of worlds wh where the proposition holds. Uh, and, um, and mathematically, um, you, can, you can 
you know, if you, well, if you follow the measure theory, you realize that in, in many, many cases, in order to have a, uh, a, a natural assignment of measures to sets, you, you, you have to assign a measure of zero to, uh, to many sets which are, are not empty. Um, and, and you just, I mean, you can't think of somebody who, is, who assigns probability zero to, um, to a sequence of all heads. You can't think of them as just excluding the possibility that uh, heads will come up uh, every time. Um, I mean, one reason you can't do it is because, because they're obviously not excluding that possibility if, if their only basis for, for doing this is a, it's a, a belief about the probability of the event. But also, um, the, the probability of uh, heads every time is going to be the same as the, the probability of any other specific outcome, any other particular sequence of heads or, t or tails. Um, because this is a fair, a fair coin. Um, and, and so if you were to exclude an outcome whenever you assigned it probability zero, you would actually have to exclude every single possible outcome of the infinite sequence of tosses. So you wouldn't be left with any, with the, with any outcomes. Um, and, and so, you know, even just thinking about the mathematical structure, you, you, you realize that, that there is an, a, a, possible, a notion here of just excluding a, a certain thing, doxastically excluding it, which it, you can think of in, in terms of the accessibility relation for, the, um, for belief, the doxastic accessibility relation, where, where um, you, you make a certain world inaccessible. Um, and, and that's different from the, the set of accessible worlds where uh, this proposition holds uh, having, having uh, measure zero. Um, okay, so that's, that's a kind of an initial um, story about w why there's a, a fundamental difference in principle uh, between outright belief and and any level of uh, credence, how, however high. Uh, maybe I'll just stop there for in case people have questions bef before going. Perhaps it's. I had a question. Yeah. I, I was thinking about whether, because the way usually we are introduced to credences is the idea that credences credences uh, reflect the subjective, the subjective point of view, in a sense, namely the, the number of, oh, how to say, the number of, uh, the probability is counted on what happened in the past. And uh, what we know is just that in this case, we have a subjective uh, probability compare with that. While uh, our belief seems to be dependent on uh, whether there is a possibility in which in the future things can be different from the past uh, or things like that. I, I was thinking whether there is any, anything or whether it is objectively or externalist uh, uh, oriented. Yeah. Your, your seems to be uh, uh, to think that it is externalist oriented, but yeah. So, uh, so uh, good. So let me develop this because, in fact, uh, I mean something I've uh, I need need to make clear, and I, I was I wasn't really being explicit about this. Is that we're actually do, we're in fact in this example we're we're dealing with um, two kinds of probability, one of which is um, what's called subjective and one of which is more um, objective. I mean, in the, in the case of the, of the subjective probabilities, which are the, I mean, these are just meant to be the degrees of belief. I mean, these are the ones which are the candidates for being identified with or having full belief reduced 
to them. Um, I mean, they're, they're subjective, and that means th that um, they just have to do with what the person does actually b believe. And I mean, let's, let's assume that, that they're um, being probabilistically coherent so that their degrees of belief do satisfy the probability calculus. But nevertheless, that's, that doesn't constrain them that much. Uh, so, it, it, I mean, it might be that they're based on the past, but, um, but, uh, for, but it, it, doesn't have to, it wouldn't have to be that. And, of course, when we're dealing with a toss of a coin, we, we don't, we're not usually thinking about statistics about coin tossing. We're usually just taking it for granted that, that the coin is, is fair. Um, but when, when these characters that I'm talking about, the uh, Lottie and Indira, um, they, they have beliefs about probabilities. And th the probabilities that they are having beliefs about are not just their own subjective probabilities. These, the, the, the probabilities that they b are believing about in these examples are more objective probabilities. I mean, th th they have to do with, um, w as it were, w what the physical setup is with the coin tossing and so on. I mean, the independence of the tosses, for example, is something that, that is, that is a, um, ultimately a, a physical feature of the setup. Um, and but the thing is that, that uh, what I'm assuming is that the, it, the agents in these examples are, are rational and that their beliefs about the objective probabilities of the lottery and the coin tosses and so on are, uh, correspond to their subjective degrees of belief in certain orderly ways, which um, David Lewis formalized in what's known as the principle. Uh, uh, principle. Um, and, and so that... Um, when, when these agents believe there's, that there's a, a physical chance of um, such and such an outcome of X, that, and that that's all the inf relevant information that they have, then they themselves have a uh, subjective probability, a credence of that thing coming about as, as X. So that so that they, they're lining up their um, subjective probabilities w with what they're believing to be the case about the o objective uh, probabilities. Um, I, and th I'm doing that in a way which Bayesians themselves uh, think it's, re it's reasonable to, to do. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Hi. Microphone. Um, <clears throat> I think I just wanted to ask some clarification concerning the Lottie case. Um, um, so I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand how this works. Uh, one thing you mentioned is that uh, um, on a model in which uh, belief is just assigning very high credence to proposition, um, we get the normative status of of Lottie uh, wrong in this case, yes. right? Um, because if the credence is very high, then that counts as, as, a, as a belief. But, but the belief uh, does not satisfy um, a relevant knowledge norm or something like that, I guess, right? Well, it's it, a, I mean, I w we don't even need a knowledge norm. We just need a, okay. a tr truth norm here, actually. That, okay. that uh, I mean, and the, but uh, in fact, it, it we don't need to be too normative about this. I mean, the question is, is just, is she making a mistake? Is, is, um, is Lottie wrong about anything? Mm -hmm. and, um, the, and then I was arguing that, well, all, all of Lottie's credences judged by an operational standard are simply the outcome of her knowledge of the probabilities. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, uh, this, and this seems to be a perfectly sort of coherent situation. Um, but but you know, if, if, if her credences 
are, are just the outcome of, I mean, of, of basically constituted by her knowledge of the, of, of the probabilities, then the, it, so far she's not making any mistake. Um, but, but if we then say, well, she has a belief that her ticket will lose, I mean, given that the example involves the ticket winning, then that's attributing a mistake to her, and, and, uh, which she doesn't seem to be making. Yeah. Right. But, I mean, you, you distinguish between uh, different kinds of norms, right? I mean, but, but, but she, suppose she believes that the ticket um, loses. Okay, she, she violates some kind of norm and belief. But, some kind of primary norm and belief, such as uh, believe only what you know or believe the truth or something like that. But you, you, um, you listed a series of uh, derivative norms, right? Such as, uh, I don't know, uh, do what a knower would do or something like this. So, so yeah. it's not clear that she, she violates those, kind, those kinds of norms, yeah. even if she, she believes the proposition, right? I mean, I think everybody can agree that, that Lottie, for, I mean, as far as the description goes, Lottie is, it, it seems to be internally coherent, but, uh, well, maybe some people would disagree. <laughs> but, but, I mean, she, she doesn't, uh, I mean, the, the, the point of the example is not that she's, that she's viol that, as it were, on this, on this view that she's violating uh, every norm, but, but it's, it's, I mean, the key thing is just, is Lottie making a mistake? And making a mistake, I'm just understanding as having a false belief. And it just doesn't seem that Lottie is making any mistake in this case. Because uh, I, everything, I mean, all, all the betting behavior and, and the stuff that is being used to assign her certain credences is based on knowledge of the probabilities, um, knowledge of the, uh, as well, the objective physical probabilities. Um, and so there's no mistake there, and that's all that, all, that's all that there is in the, in the example. Um, and so you know, it, it doesn't matter too much exactly what we you know, want to take as the operative norm of, of belief. This, is, it's not, it's, this example is not being hooked up so closely to the, the particular norms I was discussing, although it's certainly relevant in the long run because w whether we think of belief as... Um, outright belief or just as reducible to, to high credence will make a difference to what norm it is appropriate. But, but I mean, you don't need to think about the issues of what's the appropriate norm for belief directly in, in assessing the example. All, all you need to focus on is the question, is Lottie making a mistake? Uh, so, I have a question about Lottie's case, uh, and I was wondering whether uh, one might try to resist the conclusion that you are trying to draw uh, by, by arguing that belief, uh, that the verb to believe is in some sense uh, context sensitive and contrastive, uh, something like this. Um, so first, I, I have no idea how to generalize this uh, to Indira's case, uh, so I, I, yes. I don't know whether this is really relevant. But I have an idea of how th we, this works in, in Lottie's case. So it would be something like this. Um, to believe that P is to have uh, a high enough degree of confidence in the proposition that P. Uh, but what does high enough mean? Well, uh, um, belief is contrastive, so it means uh, uh, higher than a certain uh, given degree of confidence. Uh, which one? Well, belief is context sensitive, so a, contextually salient degree of confidence. And uh, the story would be something like, usually uh, we, we want to contrast uh, to believe with uh, being uncertain, right? So the, the contextually salient degree of confidence is something like 0.6. And so having a degree of confidence of 0.8 counts as believing that P. But in your story, something happened, and so you made salient a very high degree of confidence. And so now we want to contrast it to believe uh, with uh, having a, that very high degree of confidence. And so the conclusion would be something like, yes, you're right, in this case, Lottie uh, doesn't believe uh, that uh, she will lose, uh, and yet, in some sense, uh, uh, belief uh, is to have, to believe that P is to have a high enough degree of confidence. So it would be kind of a yeah. way to accommodate. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to discuss 
uh, semantic accounts of the term believe more uh, it, later on, possibly tomorrow rather than today. Um, and so I'll, I'll give a, a fuller response to what you're saying there. But the, I mean, the point that I would like to make just for the time being is that the, the argument that I'm giving that Lottie is not making a mistake does not itself be, um, seem to be sensitive to um, where a threshold is set for belief because the, the argument that is just she's not making a mistake because everything um, in her for the betting behavior and the other stuff that's being used as a basis for attributing a certain degree of belief to her is simply based on her knowledge of probabilities and that would be true no matter where the the threshold was set um, and so uh, that's so that even even if we uh, we did a lot of work to to make uh, much lower degrees of, um, of 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 belief salient in the context. I could so that we could we could pull the uh, the the threshold for applying the term believe you know way down below Lottie's high degree of belief. The 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 argument that I'm making could still could still be used. So so. Uh, so that we would, so as it were, in an appropriate um, setting, we would we would still get this this problem, and um, and and that will that will apply for for um, for any kind uh, of uh, however whatever degree of belief Lottie has. Um, so so. Okay, maybe there is something that, I, that I'm not getting. Um, so this is really a clarification question. Uh, so I thought that you're interested in the conclusion that Lottie is not making a mistake yes. because you want to draw the conclusion that uh, Lottie uh, doesn't believe in this situation that, that she will lose. Because otherwise, I mean, if she believes that, then she's making a mistake. Yes, yes right? that's the idea. Yeah. Uh, so what, what I was trying to say, but, but of course, there is another conclusion, right? Which is, uh, uh, which is something like a corollary of this conclusion, which is, uh, look, if, if Lotte doesn't believe that she will lose in this case, uh, then uh, uh, to believe that P is not to have a high enough uh, degree of confidence in the proposition that P, right? This is something like a, a further conclusion. Right? Yeah. So, that is, that so what I was trying to say is uh, we can buy the first conclusion and say that actually in this case Lottie doesn't believe that she will lose uh, and yet this is kind of uh, uh, also the conclusion of someone who, who wants to, to, to say that to, be, to believe that P is to have a high enough degree of confidence because basically a proponent of, of the theory that I sketched, uh, I think he, he would say something like, look, yes, of course, Lottie doesn't believe that, that she will lose in this case and yet uh, to believe that P is to have a high enough degree of confidence that P. So it was something like this. Yeah, but, but one thing, but I, I thought you were going for a contextualist view. So that the, yeah. I mean, that the, but with a contextualist view, the, the threshold for the application of the term believe is set by the, the conversational context, right? So it's not set by Lottie herself. It's set by us as people who are talking about Lottie. Yeah. Um, and um, and so so we can so on this um, this contextualist view of of the application of the term uh, believe we can be in a uh, in a context where the uh, the threshold for the application of the term believe. Is lower than lo than the, than Lottie's degree of belief, so we can put ourselves in um, a context where we are going to say that Lottie does believe because she she comes above the the relevant uh, threshold, but by the standards of our context. But um, we, we've also got the argument that. She doesn't believe because, uh, because she's not making a mistake. And that argument can be run in any context. And so there's still 
a, the contextualist view is still leading to um, a false uh, prediction for the, the, the case in, in which the, the threshold is sufficiently low. Right, so it's, it's still running into, tr into trouble. Sandro. Um, so <clears throat> those who, I know it's not you, identify belief with high credence, uh, high level. Uh, so do, do they generally assume that to have the concept of belief, one has to have some sort of probability theory, uh, some uh, knowledge of probability theory, because it strikes me that the ability to attribute belief is an ability that comes on kind of early on in human beings. Yes. So we can say that, I think correctly, that children sometimes believe that someone has a certain belief and so on. Uh, if we identify belief with high credence, then uh, that would mean that they would have to have some knowledge of probability theory to, to, to accept that identification. Yeah. Um, so obviously if we thought that you needed to, ha to have some knowledge of mathematical probability theory to attribute beliefs, we're, we're, we're going to get terrible results because, um, I mean, as you say, with, with young children, but after all, um, uh, you know, until the, the, the 1600s, um, there was no mathematical theory of, of, of probability. <laughs> um, and um, I, I can't resist an, an anecdote. I, I, again, that I, I was once giving a, um, a talk at the University of Southern California, and, um, and I, I, I was talking about probabilistic w ways of thinking and I, and I said look you know after all these are very uh, re re recent ways of thinking because because no, no, nobody thought in terms of mathematical probability until the 1600s and and there was a roar of laughter because um, I'd referred to the 1600s as, as recent um, which in California they, they don't uh, count that way but but uh, so I, I think as it were it, Probably the best line for the, the, these um, people who, who want to reduce uh, be belief to credence is to say that, that this is not intended as a semantic analysis, that, um, that it's intended to be an account of um, what in fact constitutes belief. Uh, that it is in fact just a state of, of high credence, um, but that, as it were, that's not something that has to be accessible to uh, speakers of the language. So it's, I mean, it's, as it were, it would have something a little bit like the uh, status of uh, um, the identification of water with H2O, that, you know, I mean, w w water is H2O, but but you don't need to know that water is H2O in order to apply the term water. And I think, I think that the picture should probably be something along those lines, that, that, that as it were, um, b belief is the term that's like water and, and then high credence corresponds to, to H2O. So. Now, my, my question or curiosity was going probably in the, in the same direction. So um, you were talking at some point, you, you said, you know, we're looking at the relationship between probability one and belief, right? And so yeah. uh, the infinitely many tosses is proving that even when you have probability yeah. one, you might not have belief. And I was thinking, well, you can look also the implication the other way around. Right? Maybe you may have reasons to think that there are some agents that have beliefs, but it makes no sense in the conditions they are in to assign probabilities. And that might be because they're children, but perhaps also because they might be automata or uh, they might be, there might be uh, states of belief that cannot be really put into co correspondence with uh, credence, if credence is behavioral, because you could think that it's very hard you know, to extrapolate, in any case, uh, some kind of credences from, uh, you know, from belief. So I, I think it, it was going in the direction you were going now. I was just yes. curious how far you could 
push the idea that uh, there may be some forms of belief that cannot put into correspondence to, to probabilities. Well, I mean, of course, th there's a, a there's a general problem of just, as it were, reading exact probabilities of um, of behaviour, um, and you know, I I, I think with, with on the whole, with the more sophisticated defenders of the uh, this sort of Lockean view of belief as high credence, they're not they're not looking for any as it were one behavioural test, but they're they're looking. I mean, they're thinking of uh, hypotheses about uh, somebody's degrees of belief as. Uh, interpretive hypotheses which then have to be judged by what predictions they make. I mean, the, no doubt in combination with hypotheses about their utilities and, I mean, their preference orderings and, and so on. Um, and, um, and I think probably people would, uh, taking this sort of view, would, they would allow that um, there might be some kind of underdetermination of the, the Credencies that you assign um, from the behaviour that that you wouldn't you, you might not get a unique distribution. I mean, and there are various proposals for how you deal with with that. Um, it's not it, it's not obvious that it's going to be anything worse than that. I mean, it's uh, um, I mean, of course, we we might we might have a um, some kind of robot that. And let's assume that we can assign degrees, I mean, that we can assign beliefs to it in some way, because after all, you know, if it doesn't make sense to assign belief to it, uh, uh, it may well not uh, make a sense to assign degrees of belief to it. But, um, but if, if, if it's just that there's nothing in the robot's behavior that's, that suggests that there's any gradedness, it could simply be that we're dealing with, you know, if, uh, from the, the point of view of these people, we're dealing with a very simple creature where all its credencies are either one or zero. Right. Um, uh, and uh, you know, if, 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 the, if what happened w with the robot was ba basically it was always absolutely confident of which possible world it was in, but some, as it were, sometimes the effect of, um, the, of evidence was to make it jump from complete confidence that it was in one world to complete confidence that it was in a different world, then, I mean, you, 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 you could uh, accommodate that within their framework just by saying that it doesn't have any of the intermediate degrees of belief. Uh, so, I mean, that, could, that can be a special case of, of their view. I mean, it's, the, the way it updates will not satisfy the, the, their, uh, their kind of uh, standards because it won't be uh, updating by conditionalization, which is part of the Bayesian um, model. But, uh, but you, you, could make, you could make some sense of it, even though you might be having to, to uh, ascribe diachronic irrationality to it because of its non-standard form of updating. Okay, so I'll, I'll go on for a little bit. What, what I've done here, which um, I hope it's not too much of a digression, but one, th one thing that, that I wanted uh, to, to just uh, argue for a bit is, is that a kind of concern that you might have about the, this use of beliefs about probabilities, which I've been invoking, um, is, is that it's uh, somehow a, a misunderstanding of uh, probabilistic uh, language, uh, because the, the, some people think that the appropriate interpretation of uh, probabilistic vocabulary in natural language um, is uh, an, an expressivist uh, one um, on on which what we're what we're really doing um, with 
uh, language which appears to be about probabilities. It's not describing probabilities, but uh, in some way, it, as it were, expressing uh, probabilities. Um, I mean, I think that that is, in any case, a, a, a very implausible view of, of what we're doing when we talk about objective probabilities uh, or chances or whatever. But I, I want just sort of briefly to, to give some, um, some comments about, uh, about why I I'd, I'd also don't think that this is a good way of understanding what is, what is going on with probabilistic language and natural. Um, probabilistic vocabulary in natural language. And of course, another thing that we could do is just say, well, let's describe the situation in using you know, some formal language where we can just talk in, in a straightforward way about probabilities. But uh, it, it's, I think it's useful to think about these matters because you know, insofar as we're concerned with what the, um, if you like, the common way, commonsensical way of thinking about these things is, um, that... Um, that that's something that's that's reflected in natural language, and actually, as, as um, the exchange with Sandra was bringing out, uh, it, to what extent natural language is is really talking about probabilities in the mathematical sense at all is somewhat doubtful, because uh, I mean the the probabilistic vocabulary um, goes back way before the development of mathematical probability theory. But as, well, how, how much that has seeped into, into natural language is not uh, obvious. And uh, I mean, if you read, for example, Hume's uh, discussion of uh, miracles, which was I mean, written after the, the mathematical probability theory had been developed, but, but before it, it was, as it were, something that, was, that you all got taught in school and, and so on. Um, I mean, you can see that, that Hume is thinking about probabilities in a way that doesn't at all correspond to, uh, to the mathematics of probability as, as we understand it. Um, and I don't, I, I don't think that that was Hume being stupid. I think that, that it was that the... <laughs> there are other ways of thinking about probability that, as it were, ha have more to do with what we might now call plausibility. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I, that, I'm not going to say so much about that issue. But, but I think it's, it is worth just to... In order to get clear about these things, and they're going to be re relevant to some of what I say l later as well, just to, to uh, think about wh how these terms are working in, uh, in natural language. And uh, I mean, the first point I, I want to, to make about this is that um, they can be used in more than one. Uh, way in natural language, and, but one way is as um, what, if you're in the sort of Fragian tradition, you might call uh, force modifiers or um, a kind of as where we're using them to uh, to qualify the whole speech act, so that we, when we, for example, when we say probably, uh, what we're doing is um, indicating. That, that what follows, as it were, the, 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 if you like, the at-issue content that we're then going to deliver um, is not being, uh, we're not asserting that, we're putting it forward in a more tentative way. And, um, I, I, and that's a, um, a use that we make of, of various kinds of terms in natural language. I mean, an, an, an example in, in English, one that's very clearly used like that is perhaps forse, um, where perhaps doesn't, it doesn't contribute anything, as far as I can see, to the, the truth conditional content of what we're saying. It's just an indicator of, you know, of a, a, some kind of qualification, a, a hedge, you know, a, a lesser degree of commitment, and um, I, and so um, one one test for these is that is whether they can can be negated. So you know, if we take the sentence, probably she's in Spain. Um, it, if you take, it is not the case that probably she is in Spain. Um, 
to my that, that's not very good. It's be, because it's not it's not quite it's not clear how the it's not the case and the probably are meant to be interacting and um, and so and as it were it, it's it, it's bad although not as bad as if you were to say it's not the case that perhaps she's in Spain, right? Because uh, I mean it's really fine if you just said perhaps. She's not in Spain. That, that, that's that's unproblematic, but uh, but if you put it's not the case outside the um, the perhaps, it seems that you're trying to negate the perhaps. But the perhaps isn't there as uh, part of contributing to the whatever truth conditional content would be negated, and so it doesn't really make sense. And I think that. that in the case of it's not the case that probably she's in Spain, there's a, a similar, although less intense, uh, um, feeling of something going wrong. Um, and I think the reason that it's less intense is that w w in that case, we can do a kind of repair quite easily, because we can, we can repair it's not the case that probably she's in Spain, um, as it is not probable that she's in Spain. Uh, or if, if you want to use, the, as it were, the full kind of negation, it's not the case that it's probable that, that she's in Spain. And, and, and those are absolutely fine. Whereas with, with it, it's not the, the case that perhaps she's in Spain. Um, <coughs> the, there's no corresponding repair that's, that's, uh, that doesn't completely change the, the, uh, the vocabulary that's being used, because perhaps cannot be used as... Um, just a, a, a sentential operator at all. It's, 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 it's only got this kind of force mo modifying uh, effect. And, and so, there, there's, so there's no nearby repair that, that will work. Um, but I mean, what that indicates is that the it is probable that is used as a, a, a sentential operator that, that delivers something uh, I mean, that contributes to the truth conditional content in a, in a quite straightforward way. So it's, it's basically a, a, a kind of modal operator. Um, and, um, and, and one thing I think that's quite unfortunate about a lot of the literature on the semantics of probabilistic constructions is that it's all focused on probably um, and I think, I think the reason that it's focused on probably is it's kind of understandable because probably is more colloquial that in, in English than it's probable that. Um, I guess it's similar in Italian. Um, and, and so, I mean, of course, semanticists prefer to, to work with the, 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 the most natural, common ways of talking where, the, as it were, speakers uh, intuitions are, are strongest and so on. But, but in this case, it's, it's very unfortunate because um, the, the effect is to focus on a term that is kind of poised ambiguously between the, 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 the qualifying force modifier and the sense modifier, if we were to talk in Freakian terms, uh, uses. Um, and so uh, it, I think it, it, it obscures what what is actually uh, going on? Um, I think we can also we, we can also see some of this um, with um, the the use of improbable, that which is quite a, an additional test. So it, it is improbable that she's in Spain. It's just uh, equivalent to it's probable that she is not in Spain. Um, If you if you try to use improbably the way that you were using probably, you get a crash. Uh, well, not a crash. I mean, it's a, as it were, there's a repair that, we, that I guess we more or less automatically do. So if you try saying improbably she's in Spain, if you try to interpret the improbably. Um, in line with the use of, of probably, you, you get a speech act which is kind of self-defeating because, because you're putting forward a certain content 
um, as you know, she's in Spain, and then they probably was supposed to say, well, you know, th th this is um, this is only being put forward as likely. But if you put improbably, it, it, it seems that you, you're you're saying this is you know you're kind of un you shouldn't have been putting it forward in the first place if you're saying that it's improbable. And in fact. Uh, the natural reading of improbably she's in Spain is something co completely different, which is um, the natural reading is contrary to what you might have expected or something like that, she's in Spain. So it's, it doesn't have to do with present probabilities at all. Um, it's, uh, it's indicating that she's in Spain and then it's kind of commenting that this was improbable um, according to the, pro the probability distribution that you had before you got the news that she's in Spain. So it's com something completely different, which is uh, an, an indication that we're dealing with um, this kind of uh, force, force modifier thing. Um, and, uh, and of course, it's, um, it, it's not at all equivalent to probably she is not in Spain, so that whereas Whereas it's improbable that is, is just equivalent to it is probable that it's not the case that. Improbably, it's not at all equivalent to probably not because um, the probably she's not in Spain, that, that, refer, that is, is about concerns present probabilities, whereas the improbable, improbably concerns uh, past uh, probabilities or, or as it were prior, if you like, probabilities. Um, and... Uh, another difference between probably and it, it is probable that, um, which, which corresponds to the fact that it is probable that is, is a fully fledged uh, sentential operator and probably isn't, is that um, it, it is probable that can also be tensed just in, in, in all the usual ways and, uh, and quite... Uh, Straightforwardly, so I mean, there's absolutely no um, problem about saying things like twelve that it, it, it was probable yesterday that she would be in Spain today, um, and uh, th that's that's simply a report of past probabilities, and so it would be quite inappropriate to give it any kind of expressivist uh, analysis. Um, what what we also have um, yes, is the use of probably within the predicate rather than just uh, in front of the whole sentence, as in she's probably in Spain, which is, is uh, extre that's also extremely um, idiomatic. Um, And, and then you get various kinds of ambiguities with that because it's not, it's not very clear whether it, she's probably in Spain um, is to be understood in the, um, the force modifier or the sense uh, modifier uh, way. Um, so, it, it, and, and this comes out in conditionals. So, if you, you, know, if you take... 14 on, on the second, top of the second page of the handout. If she's probably in Spain, she's probably on uh, vacation. Um, the thing about that is that the, the probably in the antecedent, doesn't, it doesn't make sense as a force modifier because you, I mean, you, could, you, because you don't want to force modifier modif modifying the um, just a, a, a constituent embedded in the overall sentence. Um, and, and so what you, the way you have to make sense of it is that it, if it's probable that she's in Spain, she's probably on vacation. Um, and you can, but with the probably in the consequent, you can either hear that as uh, modifying the 
the truth conditional content or as as actually a a comment in effect a comment on the on the whole sentence but just stuck in the consequent of the, as the, the and and the difference comes out more if you take if she's probably in Spain she's probably in Spain um, because th th that's that is also ambiguous in with respect to the the probably in the uh, the consequent um, because the, I mean it, with the antecedent it has to be under the, the probably has to be understood as contributing to the truth conditional content um, and so uh, you can also understand the probably um, in the consequent as contributing to that and so then you get the completely tautologous uh, interpretation of it as if it's probable that she's in Spain it's probable that she's in Spain but there is actually uh, surprisingly um, a, a reading of it in which it's not at all a tautology because if you take I mean the the probably in the antecedent as um, just contributing to truth conditional con content but you take the the probably in the consequent as a, a force modifier then the truth conditional content that is being put forward but as it were in a tentative way is the content if it's probable that she is in Spain then she is in Spain and th that content can be false right because it can be probable probable but false <laughs> that she's in Spain and so uh, on the on the, on the second re reading um, the, th the thing that you're, the proposition that you're putting forward tentatively is one that may be false. So that's, that's not at all the, the same as the, the tautologous uh, reading. Okay, so I, I mean, I don't want to, to spend a huge amount of time on the semantics of uh, probability ascriptions, but... Sorry. Yeah. I, I miss something here. Uh, I'm missing something. Um, because in the end, you seem to, in talking about the conditional, you seem to talk as if uh, probably is ambiguous between a, a, a force modifier yes. and a propositional modifier. But I thought that when you um, uh, commented on three, uh, you were saying, well, probably is a force modifier, but then somehow three is not as bad as we might expect it to be because speaker reinterpret it as a uh, propositional modifier on the uh, at the same level as yeah. it is not probable that but if it is ambiguous probably between a force modifier and a propositional modifier you actually lose the uh, uh, the datum in three right which is mildly uh, Infelicitous. Yes. So, my view is that it really makes a difference where the probably comes, uh, and that if um, if it comes right at the beginning, then there's there's more pressure to uh, to interpret it um, as a force modifier. But if it's if it's Im embedded in the predicate as as it is in uh, 15, um, then it's much, it's e easier to get the, the truth, the truth conditional reading. Um, and, and so, so I think that it, it's not the case that she's probably in Spain. It's actually better than it's not the case that probably she's in Spain. Because the, there's let you would expect the difference between if she probably is in Spain, if she is probably in Spain, she is probably on vacation, and if probably she is in Spain, probably she is on vacation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think if probably she's in, if probably she's in Spain, is bad. Uh, yeah, it's bad. It's really bad okay. uh, because there's, as I say, there's much more pressure okay. to read the probably as, a, yeah. as a, a force modifier if if it's out in uh, in front. Um, so, so just yeah. So just to round off this dis discussion of the semantics of of probability, which is of um, 
locutions, which I'm kind of interested in for its own sake as well as in relation to the, the more general epistemological issues. I, I'm very, very suspicious that there is any need at all for fancy expressivist uh, semantics for probabilistic locutions. It, as far as I can see, um, once, once you've separated the force modifier and the sense modifier uh, locutions, and you see that in some cases we're dealing with uh, uh, uses of probability, uses probably which, which can be interpreted as either. I'm not, I'm not clear that there's anything that really needs to be explained by anything much fancier in, these, in the semantics than that. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll stop here, uh, and we, we can have maybe a, f a few questions on this if, pe if people have them, and then, and then we'll uh, take a break. Uh, um. Would you say that also believe can be used as a force modifier? Because, I mean, I think that I can say things like, she's in Spain, I believe. Yes. And actually, if I embed it under negation, at the end, if I say it is not the case that, that she's in Spain, I believe, I don't get the interpretation that I believe modifies the complement, but also um, modifies the force of the whole sentence. Okay. Um, so it would seem that I believe can act as a force modifier in the same way as probably. Yes, I, 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 think, I think that's, that's right, and, and, uh, and I agree that well, and if, yes, if it comes at the at the believe at, um, uh, if it comes at the end of the the sentence, I believe that then I think that pretty much forces it to be a, a force modifier, and and I think the same in fact will be true with probably she's in Spain probably yes in fact. yes yeah so I think in in a way it's uh, it's um, it's e it's even harder. To, to read that as, I mean, it's almost virtually impossible because the, rep the repair is much more drastic because you've got to move it from the, um, yeah. yeah. If, if you put it at the end under negation, if you say it is not the case yes. that she's in Spain, probably, yes. again, probably cannot modify the complement. Uh, it has yes. to modify yes. the whole sentence. It, yes, uh, ab absolutely. I, yeah, I totally agree. I had a question about the force modifier. The, when we have this kind of reading, what is your interpretation of it? Uh, because in the case of the sentential operator, it seems that somehow probability uh, works with the sentence. But in the, sen in the case of the force modifier, you seem to be, you said that you were ex skeptical about an expressivist uh, interpretation of it. And I, I thought that the, the expressive the interpretation is the correct one, but probably misunderstood well, what you said. So when, when I'm talking about, uh, yeah, so I, I should have been clear about this. So when I'm, when I'm talking about an expressivist semantics, what, what I have in mind is one where the, an expression is, is taken as fully part of the compositional semantics, so that it's where it's, it, it can, um, it, whatever, whatever kind of compositional semantics we're doing, we're, we're applying, you know, written in a kind of, you know, the, the normal rec recursive way. It's, it's applying to these uh, uh, operators, um, the, you know, as to anything else, so, so that, that um, it means that they can then be embedded under all sorts of further constructions, and then you, that's why the the, the um, semantics has to be so fancy to to deal with that. So I I, I wasn't thinking of the, the the expressivist semantics as being invoked just by um, the, the the use of these force modifiers. But I mean, it's, it's true that in a way you could think of what the, the force modifiers are, are doing as a kind of expressivist thing, but it's, but it's at such a, um, as well, a superficial level that, that I, I wasn't, that wasn't what I had in mind. But because, I mean, various people who have worked on the semantics of uh, probability expressions have, have wanted to treat it 
as um, fully compositional, but at the same time as requiring some kind of expressivist uh, treatment, because it's, as it were, it's expressing the speaker's uh, probabilities rather than just, just as worth straightforwardly describing them. And, and it's, it's that kind of sophisticated semantics that I, I don't really see is, is called for by the actual phenomena of, of probability talk in natural language. Uh, it seems to me that, that it's enough just to separate out the, the force, the force mo modifier use from the sense modifier use and, and then just say the standard things that, that you'd say about a force modifier. That, um, so yes, I mean the probability. Sorry, the probability as a force modifier. It, it is indicating that I am not making an out-and-out -out assertion. It's made, you know that I'm just putting forward something as probable, uh, and so I'm not, for example, bound by a, a knowledge norm or a truth norm of a, of assertion. Um, I mean, it's. I mean, it, of course, if I say probably blah, and then it turns out that not blah, then, then I, what I was putting forward is. I mean, I, in a way, it was incorrect because I was putting something f forward, something as false. But, but uh, I'd, I'd, because I'd given a kind of health warning, I'm, you know, I'm not. Uh, it doesn't seem, a, a, you know, a, 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 the kind of violation that anybody could could blame me for. <laughs> Okay, I have a, a curiosity and a clarification about the use, uh, I guess this is the methodology that we're following here. So we are looking at ordinary language, right? And uh, I mean, I suppose, honestly, I never looked at this in two different languages. Uh, I just think in a little bit, maybe already probable, improbable in Italian, my function slightly differently. I don't know how it functions, you know, in other languages. But so, uh, are you then going to be committed to the fact that uh, if in other languages we find actually different, you know, semantics for believing or for then probability ascriptions, um, then we, we have to have different uh, philosophical notions? Or of course, you know, what happens when, of course, the English language might change or if people decide to drop. I, it's just a, a question of methodology, I guess, yes. yeah, what, what we are trying to follow because I was, I, I'm really intrigued by the historical uh, evidence, yeah. you know, the fact that until 1600 we didn't have this linkage. But then I also think how often, you know, we think, oh, who cares about what's, what has been in history, you yeah. know, so far if we have reasons, theoretical reasons for having this notion, we should have it. So I'm trying to understand the type of arguments yeah. we have here. So. So, a number of things. One is, uh, my guess would be that in these respects, Italian is the same as English, but I'm very willing to be corrected by, by native speakers. I mean, I would have, I mean, we've got this, I mean, you know, in Italian, there's both a probabile che and there's a probabilmente, and, and my, my, as far as, I'm not aware of any way in which they're actually different from the, the corresponding terms in, in English. Um, of course, that, that, if that's so, it, 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 that doesn't answer the, the more general methodological question that you're raising, which is, um, how, you know, what are, what are we to make of all of all this? Um, and um, and yeah, because, it, of course, it, in principle, it could work very differently in different uh, languages. And I mean, this is this is a, a methodological challenge that. Uh, has been raised a lot, for example, w with the work that I did with Jason Stanley on, on know-how and, and w w ways in which that might or might not differ across uh, languages. So, um, so it's, this, is part, this is partly a, a question of, uh, as it were, I mean, there are two things that, that, that we're studying here. I mean, one is we're studying, well, or maybe three, we're studying how the language works. We're studying uh, how people think about these matters, and we're also studying about the first order matters themselves, see, in this case, probability. And um, so, you know, insofar as we're concerned uh, with the, the, as it were, the subject matter of probability uh, itself, then um, I'm, 
I don't think I've been I've drawn any controversial consequences f from it just um, f from from what I've been saying. Or, but because the, the, I mean the consequences I've, I've been talking about just depend on the fact that uh, that for probability itself is just that. As far as English goes, you can t you can talk about it in this straightforward truth conditional way, in which we make true or false reports about probabilities. Um, insofar as we're talking, we're interested in the question of you know how people think about these matters. Um, then, of course, that's something that, in principle, uh, certainly can be culturally variable um, and and so we so we have to be cautious about um, drawing universalist conclusions just from looking at, at one language although um, I mean one th one thing that is striking about a, a lot of the, the very basic um, Epistemic cognitive vocabulary in, is how 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 universal that does seem to be across languages. I mean that that every um, every, every language has a, a word. I mean every human natural language that's known is, uh, seems to have a word w w that means something like no. And um, and one actually the most the most idiomatic of word of. In English, it's not believe but think, and and th that also seems to be more or less <laughs> universal across human natural languages, and um, you know, and I so I, th I mean, my own inclination is to think that that, that there's a whole bunch of um, w just ways of thinking human ways of thinking about human th about thinking uh, uh, um, and and knowing which which are pretty much hardwired into us and which uh, w every normal human being will get I mean of course this is something that's very controversial and um, you know people were claiming that the Getty AQ, the, the, I mean, the X5 negative program was one point claiming that that, that something like the assessment of Getty cases was not, was not at all a human universal, but I think the accumulating evidence is that actually it probably is a human universal. And so I'm, you know, my inclination is to think that that there are human ways of thinking about probability that probably, you know, that I suspect are universal, but but amongst human beings, although that's of course that's a wild conjecture. Um, but I mean, I think the connection with mathematical probability theory is very striking because that's a um, a way in which uh, something historically has changed and and that has to some extent imbued, you know, you know, non technical ways of thinking. And so, um, for example, you know, we, we can now say it's a hundred percent probable that. I, may, I don't know whether people would ever have said something like, you know, the equivalent of that. I mean, the idea of probability one or zero maybe didn't make any sense um, and, uh, before. So that, that I think that, um, that some uses, and not just uh, technical uses of probability talk now, uh, you know, are colored by our knowledge of uh, mathematical probability theory. But I think underneath that, there's something else going on. But, and, you know, one sign of this might be the famous conjunction fallacy, um, where, uh, you know, there's lots and lots of evidence that people, including people who've been educated in probability theory, will will judge um, a conjunction as more probable than one of its conjuncts, right? which of course makes absolutely no sense in, uh, in mathematical terms. And, um, and what seems to be going on there is that what, the way of thinking that we slip back into when we're not, as it were, you know, in kind of system two, remembering the probability lessons we had at school or whatever, is that that we're thinking we're thinking in terms of probability as something more like plausibility, where you know, where um, we're judging things by how well they they fit 
sort of stereotypes and, and that kind of thing. And, and in that case, a, um, you know, a, certain, a, a certain conjunction um, can, can fit a stereotype better than one of its conjuncts does and so be found m m more, more plausible. And so, so I think what we've got is, a, as it were, a, you know, a kind of sophisticated system that we get through education, but which you know, is quite widespread now in, in a, a lot of cultures, on top of a very primitive, maybe more or less hardwired <laughs> alternative system that, uh, for, for thinking about these matters. And, the, and, and they're, they're, there may be cases where these are even competing for, you know, for, for how we th understand these, these probabilistic terms. So I think there's, there's, there's some culturally dependent um, things going on there, which have more, as it were, I think, to do with, with the history than, uh, but, but also with, I guess, with level, levels of, of education in probability theory. But, uh, but I mean, if anybody notices a way in which the probability terms work differently in Italian from in English, I'd be very interested to, to hear it. But my conjecture is that it's not, it's not very different. Should we take a break now? And then, um, Yes. Okay, so I, I want to say a, a bit about uh, what the the functional role of of full belief uh, might uh, might be. Um, and uh, and this uh, this is related to something that I was uh, talking about in the questions yesterday when I was when we I think Clotilde was asking about the uh, relation between believing that and believing in um, and I, I was saying that there's the, the common strand uh, uh, running through them is some kind of trust and um, and I think that. The key, a key mark of um, trust for the uh, for the functional role of uh, for belief is um, is this that the rough, roughly speaking, the way one trusts in a proposition is by um, relying on it in practical reasoning. So relying on it in the sense that one's using it as a premise uh, in practical reasoning. Um, and by practical reasoning, I mean r reasoning that uh, issues uh, in an intention to do something. Um, and so that, that in effect, I mean, this is an, uh, this is an old idea that, that, that beliefs are what you act on. Um, and... I mean, the reason I'm, I, I'm emphasizing the practical reasoning is that, um, of course, we, we sometimes use uh, mere suppositions or assumptions as premises in the sense that, that we suppose something and then we reason from it. Um, and, uh, for example, we, we, we may do that in reductio ad absurdum reasoning, where we... we we suppose P, and then we, we take it as a premise, and then we, we, from P we reach a contradiction, and then we end up uh, denying P, I mean, in a mathematical proof, for example. Um, and so, obviously, that kind of use of, a, of, a, of P as a premise does not uh, indicate belief. But um, I'm t that's why I, I take practical reasoning, because these, these, are, uh, these are premises of an argument that leads to an intention. So you're, you're as a way, you're, in that sense, you're, you're trusting it. Um, and, um, and that's, I take it, what's notably lacking in the cases of uh, Lottie and uh, Indira, because they would not take 
the proposition that the ticket will lose or that tails will come up at, at least once as premises in a piece of reasoning. Um, the premises that they would be using in their reasoning uh, would be um, ones about probabilities. Right. I, I mean, the reasoning doesn't have to be sort of very conscious reasoning, but it's, it, uh, it's still uh, what, what proposition people are actually uh, relying on. Um, so, so as well, that's that's a kind of functional role, and I t and I take that uh, to be to be typically different from uh, any kind of functional role associated with uh, credences. Um, I think a a more general way that I would like to think of this um, is that believing P in this outright full sense is treating P in the way in which one treats things that one knows. So it's, in effect, it's treating P as if uh, it were knowledge. Not, not necessarily in the sense that, that you're thinking that it's knowledge, but that um, the kind of acting on it that we're concerned with is what you do with, typically, with things uh, that, you, that you know. Um, and one... effect of this is that that we get a, a derivation um, from the characterization of belief or of the uh, implication from from knowledge to belief because um, I mean if you know thing if you know something then you you know it, you treat it in the way that you treat things that you know um, and and therefore you count as uh, as believing it um, and and so uh, so this is the the kind of way um, in which we can get the connection between knowledge and belief from a, a knowledge first sort of standpoint in which we take knowledge rather than belief as the primary ex explanatory uh, notion which that I mean that was a, a research program for which I was arguing in uh, in knowledge and its limits. I mean, if, you know, the alternative way of getting the connection is by an analysis of knowledge in terms of, of belief and truth and then extra things, you know, of the, uh, as in the, both the, the justified true belief for kind of knowledge and in the, all the post Gettier uh, proposals. Uh, um, so that, I mean, you, 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 can, you can come at that connection from, from either uh, direction. Um, and, and when I'm talking about treating um, P as something that you that you, you know, I'm I'm I particularly have in mind as it were the the, um, the 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 picture that that belief is what plays the same local role as knowledge. Um, so that, as it were, local, for example, in practical reasoning, that, that just as it's typical of, of things that, that you know, that, uh, that you use them as premises in your practical reasoning, um, things qualify as uh, belief because you treat them in the same way. I mean, from a, 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 a more external point of view, they, they may be different in various ways. I mean, the, the beliefs um, may come about through... Um, processes which, I mean, which may just be, may, may be cases where you're unlucky and there's just something out there in the environment which, which makes it not a case of knowledge but just a case of belief. Or it may be that even that, that this is an irrational belief which was formed in some kind of crazy way but still um, it, it plays the, the same role as knowledge in practical reasoning, as it were. Once, once you input it into the practical reasoning, then it's, it's playing the, this role of uh, a premise. 
Um, and, and so the, the kind of background picture that I'm suggesting here is, is one on which the, the norm of belief comes from the fact that, that belief is, as it were, it's either knowledge or it's pseudo-knowledge, if you like, and uh, that, it's, that it's, it's doing what knowledge is supposed to do. And so it's, it's, it's really only got a right to be doing that if it is knowledge. But, uh, and so that's why we should be, um, be judging um, it by that, that standard. Um, and, and so the, 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 as well, the methodology uh, here is... Uh, is to think uh, in terms of the the kind of success uh, notions in the um, like like knowledge, which is um, requires truth and appropriate connections and so on, and um, and then um, and th then belief is understood as something which is is of the similar in in its local operation to knowledge and. Uh, but, and then and is to be judged uh, accordingly. And so the as well the the, the big picture um, is of um, the the hallmark of intelligent life as uh, as being acting on your knowledge, and um, and then. As it were, the the rest of one's mental life being being judged in relation to that standard of 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 what it is for things to be going well. That's as it were, when things are going well, then you're acting on what you know. Um, when things go badly, if they go badly at the input end, then you may just be acting uh, um, on what you uh, believe. Um, and if they go badly at the um, at the output end, then you, you're, you're forming intentions, but but you don't you don't act on these intentions. Or if you do act, you maybe you, you attempt to do something, but the attempt uh, fails, and uh, and so on. Or or things go wrong in, in some other way. So that's as we're just that's just a kind of a, a note on what the big uh, picture uh, is. Um, there's. Uh, you know, uh, there's a question about uh, how how similar the treatment of something needs to be for it to uh, to count as uh, as belief, and and so w w one kind of case which could be used to challenge what I'm uh, saying are cases where uh, in in science, you know, often scientists know that some theory is false, but that nevertheless it's a very good uh, approximation. Um, and, um, and, and so they may, they may use the theory on th to make lots of calculations, even though um, that they know it's, it's false. And, um, and so an example of this would be uh, Newtonian mechanics, which uh, is is known to be strictly speaking false, but it's but it's also an extremely good approximation to the truth, uh, and for for many many engineering purposes, it's it's absolutely fine to make calculations uh, using a, a Newtonian framework because the at, at the level that you're concerned with the, the the errors will just be so small that they don't. They don't matter, and and so uh, so w one um, issue for what I'm saying um, is uh, w whether because we're we're treating let's say New Newtonian mechanics in in a way so close to the way that one, that one treats things that one knows that whether they're going to come out as um, cases of uh, belief. By 
by uh, my standard, which would be the wrong result because it's clear that scientists, I mean, the engineers, you know, who know perfectly well that, that, it, that, that Newtonian mechanics has been superseded by, you know, by Einstein's relativistic um, theory, they, they don't actually believe uh, Newtonian uh, mechanics. Um, and so, I mean, there, I think one has to, uh, has to look quite, carefully at what's, uh, at what's going on, because it, you know, th there is a sense in which uh, they're, they're using um, the, the, the Newtonian mechanics as a premise in practical reasoning, because they've, de they've decided that that's a sufficiently good approximation for them to go ahead and do it. Um, but um, it, it's, it is, as we're modulated by their um, awareness of the, the fact that this is only an approximation. Um, and, um, and certainly, if supposing, as it were, per impossibile, that, that it turned out that um, Newtonian mechanics was, was true all along, and, and you know, all, all, all the experiments that had seemed to show that Einstein was right were fake or something. I mean, let's just pretend that for a moment. Um, then definitely engineers could not claim that they'd known all along that, that, that Newtonian mechanics was correct. Uh, um, just um, so that th it's clear that this w the way that they're treating, treating it does not correspond to uh, knowledge, even if we assume that, that everything else w uh, was was fine, and and so that um, the the kind of functional role that that we're fixing on uh, here, uh, it has to be one that is suitable for uh, for knowledge in order for it to uh, to count as um, as belief, um, and uh, and so that, that in cases where there is this mediating role of, you know, a belief that this isn't true, but it's it's a good enough um, approximation to be used for the certain purposes. That seems to be enough to defeat the analogy with with knowledge, and so one one has to uh, take that into account in applying this standard uh, for uh, belief. Um, so. So, in certain respects, it has, it has to be really quite, quite close to, to the the knowledge role in uh, in order to come out as belief. So, the, so that's the um, the kind of qualification that's required there. Um, there's a, a further issue which I'm not going to go into because I said I wouldn't talk really much about the the psychology and the cognitive science, but which is uh, I, I certainly think it is a, a really important uh, one, um, which is to what extent are credences psychologically real? Um, I mean, how how far are these uh, states that uh, that w we are really uh, in? Because you know, I. I th I think an another question about the whole Lockean program is just what the psychological status of credences is. And, um, and I think that the Lockeans have, have not taken very much interest in, in what the psychological uh, situation actually is. I think, they've, I think that's partly a legacy of... Um, the idea that, that these things could be operationally defined, and so as long as you weren't dealing with irrational people, uh, you, you, would, uh, you would find, you would just be able to identify what their credences uh, were. Um, and I think it's partly based on the assumption that, that, that there are degrees of uh, confidence, um, which clearly, I mean, that we can clearly be more or less confident in, uh, in things. Uh, and therefore, that the, that shows already that we have uh, credences. Um, so, uh, on those two points, I think that 
the operational tests are, are, are absolutely not enough to, to show that, that there are, as it were, psychologically real uh, states uh, here. Um, in part because uh, it, it's not clear that the, the results that we get uh, from, from or that we would get if we tried to measure people's credences by, um, by betting behavior and so on, uh, are really um, anything but, or anything more than uh, artifacts of the process of testing. I mean, that, so the, the, as well, the, the credences that we have elicited might be ones that were created by the you know, asking people, you know, whether they're going to accept certain bets. I mean, they, it doesn't, we're not necessarily drawing on anything that was there all along. And, we, and so we would, I mean, we certainly need to investigate, for example, um, how much difference it, it made to the credencies as they were measured by betting behavior, what order you were asked about the bets in. You know, I mean, it, it could be if you're asked about, you know, bet one, first and bet two second, that, that, that that will indicate a completely different set of credencies compared to the case where you're asked about bet two first and then bet one second. I mean, that's, I mean, you know, that's a matter for a, a psychological uh, investigation. And it's also a matter for psychological investigation uh, to what extent the, the kinds of credencies that, that we got from this would, would, would uh, correspond to the um, axioms of mathematical probability. This now is not a question about how far we think of probability in mathematical terms, but how far the probability as me measured by these operational tests or behavioral tests would in fact uh, correspond to, um, to, ma to the axioms of uh, probability. And uh, you know, I think w w in the kind of Bayesian tradition, what people tend to think is, well, look, it, you know, it, we've got all these results which show that if your probabilities don't have the structure of mathematical probability and, and you make bets on them, then, then you, you're in trouble because you're going to be subject to, to Dutch books in which where you, uh, however you, you bet, you're going to lose. Uh, sorry, I mean, however, whatever the, uh, not however you bet, but whatever the outcome, uh, you're, you're going to lose. And, you know, and so I think, as it were, there may have been some kind of background assumption that um, that evolution would not have made us like that, because, because as it were, a species which was too subject to, uh, to, Dutch, uh, to Dutch books um, would would be would be liable to um, you know to be uh, wiped out um, but you know it's it's not as though it, it, it's sort of ecologically plausible that there are all these clever bookies around you know in nature you know who are subjecting us to Dutch books and uh, and punishing you know so that we become money money pumps so it's not it's not obvious that the the actual evolutionary pressures against um, as it were, having dispositions which, if you try to turn them into credencies, will produce credencies that are incoherent by the standard of the mathematical probability. It's not obvious that that is going to be heavily punished um, in uh, evolutionary uh, terms. Um, and the, the second thing is about the, 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 the kind of sense in which it's kind of just obviously observable that, that, that we have fluctuating degrees of, of confidence and uh, that we are more confident in some things than in others that it shouldn't be assumed that th those levels of confidence have much to do with um, credences in the, in the mathematical uh, sense, because um, confidence you know, ha may have to do with you know, um, how How much we're, we're willing to, to trust. I mean, they, they, so as whether they, if we're talking about, about levels of trust, I mean, there are m many, many things that we don't trust at all. I mean, you know, there are lots of propositions that w we wouldn't trust them, and we wouldn't trust their negation, and uh, um, and but, you know, simply because because when. 
we just don't feel confident in them, we don't feel confident in their negation, and there just is no, you know, there's no level of confidence applied. And, um, you know, but, and the, but that all might, might all be just, uh, as it were, to do with um, how e easily our outright belief in something is, um, can be undermined, you know, by things, uh, by, by uh, new experience or, or whatever. And, um, and those, those kind of uh, degrees of, if you like, of outright uh, belief, uh, they, they, don't, they don't need to correspond to the, um, to the axioms of, of probability. And, um, I mean, one, one specific point I think that's maybe just worth uh, mentioning is that I think that Bayesians, I mean, they, they often have this picture that, look, if you just have uh, the outright belief as your bottom line, you know, you, so that you're going, to, you're going to accept all kinds of crazy uh, bets where, you know, if you... Um, you know, let's say a bet where, uh, it, you know, if you, um, if P, um, then, then you, you, you win, um, you know, one cent. Um, and if, if not P, um, then you and everybody that you love is horribly uh, tortured and ex executed. And, and supposing you have an outright belief in P, and, you know, it seems, I mean, the thing that worries Bayesians is about, about the uh, picture of outright belief that, that non-Bayesians have is, well, um, if, you, if you just outright believe, believe P, then surely this is a sensible bet to, to take because, because it follows from what you believe, that you will win one cent. So, you know, what's wrong? I mean, so it's like being given one cent, so, you know, of course. And... Um, and they say, but look, that, that's obviously crazy. That uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't take that uh, bet, um, and and that we, that we need we need credences, uh, and it, in fact, credences that are neither one nor zero to, to handle this sort of case. I think there's a very simple point, which is, was worth making about why Bayesians are not in a strong position to make that argument, which is that we can just take the case where P itself is a complex logical truth. Because for, the Bay for Bayesians, uh, any complex logical truth gets probability one. And therefore, the Bayesians are committed to uh, accepting this bet on a complex logical truth. But, you know, the, I think the natural human reaction is that's that's just as crazy as accepting it on some empirical proposition, because, um, you know, the, I mean, even if you, you know, you've, let's say, some complex uh, tautology, and you've done the truth table, it, you know, it, it is a tautology. Um, and, you know, but, but, you know, the sensible thing to, to think is, um, okay, I've, I've done the calculation, but it's not absolutely inconceivable that, that I made a mistake with the truth table. Um, and therefore, it's just, I should not be risking, you know, something as serious as this um, for, for one cent, e even though, the, you know, uh, according to my calculations, this, was, this is a surefire thing. And so uh, I think that this the kind of extremely sensible human reaction, just, you know, as well, the reaction is, just don't go there. <laughs> however, however, you know, confident you feel about P, don't go there. And th that is, is something that um, as it has to do with a, a kind of trumping mechanism that um, is, is not going to fit a standard model of rationality of either a Bayesian or a, an, an outright belief kind. Um, it's, it's something that it, it's obviously 
sensible for us to have, a, a psychological mechanism that, that creatures like us need, but it, it's not going to fit any simple model of rationality. OK, let's, uh, time for questions. So I'm, I'm not sure that I have understood this last example. This is the case, so it is just a clarification question. The case P is a tautology, it's maybe a, a very complex tautology. And I make my calculation and I establish that it is a tautology. But I'm not betting on the fact that P is a tautology. Or no, you're just betting on P itself. No, I don't bet on yes. P because there is a slight possibility that I made a wrong calculation. Is that? Yeah. Uh, that's the case. So, you know, I mean, if. If somebody offers me a, you know, a bet, uh, and you know, I know I can make one cent, or even you know, if you think that one, set is, if one cent is, is a, just a nuisance and isn't worth even spending time on, I mean, you know, make it 10 euros or something. Mm -hmm. But um, if somebody, you, you know, comes, and uh, of course, the, there's a particular thing which is that you know, when people offer you bets, you, you, know, you ha kind of have to think about their motives and so on. But let's, even, let's put that aside. I mean, let's, let's assume that, that uh, somehow we know that this is, uh, that the person, this is not a con man who's offering us the, the bet. Um, uh, it, it seems just by ordinary human standards, it's absolutely crazy to, to risk something as awful as you, know, your, you and all your loved ones being horribly tortured and executed for some small gain. Um, that it, it's just not worth it. You, and so, sorry, just yeah. to understand. So the case is that if I don't bet, they won't be horribly uh, tortured anyway. Yes, yes. Uh, if you don't bet, if you don't bet uh, they, uh, neither uh, of this, uh, not, just nothing happens. <laughs> and life is, just uh, goes on normally. Uh, um, it's, it's only, the, the, so this is if you make the bet. Uh, right. Sorry, yeah, I should, uh, yeah, uh, maybe uh, that, uh, yeah. Okay. If, yeah, if you bet, then uh, this is what happens. If, if, if you don't bet, of course, no, nothing particular happens. Right, right, I see. And, uh, and so uh, I, I, what I'm suggesting is that the, the Bayesianism gives what feels like the wrong answer to, to the, this question. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this question is, is very, very similar um, <laughs> to the question that they're posing to the, the non-Bayesian, who's, uh, who's saying the same thing, not just about um, tautologies, but about other things that we know. Because, I mean, there are lots of things that we know that um, we're more confident of than logical tautologies, you know, of any complexity. Like, you know, it, it's... You know, I mean, so you know, if we took, let's, you know, maybe Percy's law. I think if I can remember it properly. P minus Q. P. I think that's it. Um, you know, are you are you more confident of that, or that you're in Milan? <laughs> Okay, so I would like to talk a little bit, if possible, about the knowledge being the norm of belief. So yeah. how we arrived at that uh, conclusion, right? So suppose, so I accept the dissociation, so to speak, between belief and credences, credences. Okay, yeah. so I accept yes. that. Okay, they, they express two different things, blah, blah. I can, I can clearly see how some, probably all beliefs, uh, you know, follow the norm of knowledge. So knowledge is a norm for many, maybe, of my beliefs. Um, I still would like to see why it has to be a norm for all of my beliefs, okay? Just, I'm thinking of cases where clearly my beliefs might not have to follow credences, but they, I might have different reasons rather than knowledge to, uh, that my norm might have in the belief. Um, I, 
I'm thinking of cases where maybe it could be virtue or it could be some, some other kind of norm, right? Yeah, that it doesn't have to deal with truth. Belief, just just okay. to be clear, what, what, what belief are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, the notion of belief that you think is expressed yes. through ordinary language. Yeah, is, but is I thought you were saying that there were particular cases where this knowledge norm didn't seem appropriate. And I was just wondering, what, you know, do you have an example in mind of a particular proposition such that believing this proposition doesn't seem the kind of thing for which knowledge norm is appropriate? Uh, I don't know. I'm thinking of cases where... Let, let's see if this, uh, if this makes sense, okay, I, I would have to, um, where I, I think it's best for me to believe that I'm happy and uh, uh, it's best for me to think that uh, I'm a kind person overall or I'm, uh, there might be other things, you know, and perhaps for me the reason to, to have that belief uh, I don't care so much about whether it's true. Yes. When I say care, what I mean is that I don't think the norm for that should be whether it's true or not. The norm for that should be whether it's attached to being perhaps some kind of virtuous agent. And by virtuous might mean that I can uh, act uh, you know, with sympathy towards others and live a, uh, you know, a nice life or a happy life or whatever you, you want to have. But are you it thinking that, that if, if, I, if I have these... If I believe that I'm kind, I'm more likely to be kind. Is that the idea? Yeah, something like that, right? So, where I, I'm not sure that it's, you know, being truth tracking seems to be the norm for that belief. But I'm, I'm really testing my intuitions here. It's just that yeah. I'm trying to. Well, so. It, if, we take, if we take somebody who's not kind, doesn't it kind of make it worse that they believe that they're kind? <laughs> probably, but with happy, with kind, I don't know, I didn't put it probably, uh, with happy, I think, you know, it's, of course, is uh, you know, the, the, all this philosophy of optimism, uh, yes. that uh, if you believe you're happy, it yeah. makes but you I mean, happy. So, of course, one thing that can yeah. happen that there is, is that there may be some self-verifying beliefs, such that if you have them, Th then they're true, but but you, in some cases that might even enable the, you to know that um, that they're true. But um, but with the belief that, that so I mean well, first of all, you know, if we take people who have the false belief that they're happy, or or um, then um, I, I mean that's that doesn't seem great at all. I mean. You know, I guess that that's something that all sorts of, you know, social reformers, you know, have have worried about. I mean, you know, I mean, let's, you know, so for example, I mean, supposing that you have a situation where um, women are oppressed um, and they're not really happy at all, but but they've been so um, brainwashed by the, the by the prevailing ideology. That, that, that they all believe that they're happy, and so they don't they don't want to to, to change their position because th that they believe that they're happy, but in fact they're not happy. I mean that seems like a terrible situation. So that, but so so I mean I'm you know I'm I'm not really in general convinced by these. No, of course, sure. But, but, but supposing we but if we just take the but I mean the, the, uh, but we don't <coughs> we don't need to focus so much on the particular examples, but if what you have in mind as, as, as were the, the kind of general issue of pragmatic justification, which I was talking about on, on Monday, in, in fact, oh, okay. um, where, so, as were beliefs that are pragmatically justified, but, um, but not um, epistemically justified, then, I mean, one thing to remember is that the, I mean, the, the kind of norms of belief have to do with the functional role of belief in general, and uh, they're not all all things considered norms, um, and um, and so uh, there can be cases in which 
uh, something sort of violates the the norm of belief, but nevertheless is uh, all things considered, uh, you know, a, a good belief to have, right? So, I mean, you know, supp let's suppose, for example, that that you're living in Stalinist Russia, and you, you um, and it might be that that for survival purposes, the, it's a good thing to believe that Stalin is a great guy because that that will. Uh, if you believe it, then then you're not going to to kind of inadvertently say anti-Stalin th things, you know, and and so you're you're not going to get into, into trouble, and 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 so it might be that that's a belief which there's some pr pragmatic reason to to have, but it still seems to be not a belief that's doing its job as a belief. Right. I mean, it's. Um, I mean, it might. I mean. It might be helping your your survival, but but not in the way that it's su supposed to. And, and you know, it, I mean, suppose suppose that in some bizarre way, your your heart could cause your blood to circulate, but not by pumping your blood, right? Um, but in some other way. I mean, that your heart would not be functioning properly if it wasn't pumping the blood, even even if it was producing. The, the some uh, effect that was needed. Uh, no, I guess if I, if I can. Um, so in the example, of course, if you pick out uh, the case of uh, you know this society of women who are oppressed and they actually think that they're happy, you know, it doesn't work. So clearly, yeah. that might be a case yeah. you know to exclude. I was thinking of cases where it actually works. Yes. You know, suppose yeah, okay. that they're happy. So those are the cases that might be more problematic, right? And. Uh, you could think, okay, in those cases, they're just, it's out of pragmatic considerations. Um, um, I, it, not but of course, we're, we're, in those in cases where it works, we're actually talking about a true belief, right? I mean, I guess there's still a question about whether it's knowledge. Well, it, the point is that it becomes true because you think it's yes. true, right? So because you think that you're happy, then it makes you happy, and that works because actually perhaps it was somewhere indifferent whether you were, it's not the case that you were oppressed. It's yes. just no, that, I, okay. you know, I'm, suppose I'm you're on an island, case. right? So and that yeah, makes I, you happy, right? And, uh, and you could think, that is not just a pragmatic thing, it's about, uh, it could be ethical, it, it could be about uh, living a happy life or virtue or, uh, you know, things that I wouldn't say are simply pragmatic. And uh, what I'm thinking is, uh, you know, when you say, then in those cases, my belief is not performing the function that the belief is supposed yes. to form. It seems you're almost buying the conclusion because you're telling me, well, the belief is supposed to track the truth. And I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting, well, in those cases, I'm not sure it just tracks the truth. Actually, it might perform a different function, which could be to live virtuously or, uh, you know, just precisely to do something else. Yeah, but... But the thing is, it, there's a question about what level we're analysing this at, but, but, because uh, it, what we're looking for is, roughly speaking, a general functional role for belief, and um, a functional role which, as it were, it, it, this will be what constitutes belief, um, and um, and so. This is something at just at the general level of what, what the nature of belief is. But then we're also, you know, kind of hoping that that we'll get we'll get something um, about what appropriate norms for belief are out of the functional nature of belief. And I mean, the the functional nature of of belief is um, it, we we can't just be something extremely general like you know to to aid the the person and make make their life go well or something because that wouldn't that would not differentiate between belief and desire or or you know or something so we need something more specific and um, the and the the kind of thing that we're talking about even if we, I mean just putting the the knowledge uh, connection aside for one moment is that uh, the, a belief. It, the functional role is that it's something that you rely on, you know, in practical reasoning. I mean, because that's at the right level of generality. I mean, any belief can, can in principle, play that, that role. And, um, and then the, 
So that if, if that's, supposing that's the appropriate functional role for belief, then the you know, question, what, what would a, a, a general norm for belief be? Well, you know, it seems like uh, in general, the things that you rely on in practical reasoning had better be uh, true or known, or, as it were, for the practical reasoning to go, to go well. Um, and um, in, and so, I mean, that's, that's, as it were, at the level of belief, that's the kind of norm that we would expect, uh, expect to have. You know, I mean, like, or just, a, I mean, another example would be, I mean, it seems natural that, you know, that you, you have a, um, you know, let's say a norm for a chair is that it should be something that you can comfortably sit on. Right? That's what a, you know. That's what a chair is for. Now, of course, I mean, you know, suppose suppose that that you have an extremely uncomfortable chair in your house, but you know, as a matter, of, in fact, it's so uncomfortable that um, anybody who visits you feels so sorry for you that they make you, you know, an anonymous. Uh, you know, gifts of, of money uh, um, after their after their visit, so that you can buy a a, a comfortable chair. And um, you know, so that the, 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 this uncomfortable chair might be doing you some good, but it's still it's still not a good chair because you know, the, the, I mean, I, I'm absolutely conceding that that there are cases where a belief that is false and um, maybe for which you have no good evidence and so on, can, in suitable circumstances, um, benefit you. That, I mean, the, the possibility of, of that phenomenon is quite clear. But I'm suggesting that, that it, it's just too incidental a, a possibility to play any role in a, in the functional role of belief, and in you know a norm which is uh, generated by the functional ro role of belief, it's just as it were, it's just lucky. Um, I mean, you know, in the same, I mean, another kind of thing is, is you know, if you take intentions, I mean, the, the pot, you know, the, what intentions are supposed, I mean, the role that they're supposed to play is in bringing about action. But of course, it, it is possible that certain intentions will will not bring about action, but will, um, but will make you feel good. You know, that, uh, so when, um, you know, a certain intent, you know, it, it might be that, um, let's say that you, that, you know, you have a, an intention to, to make a, a, a pilgrimage to Jerusalem or something. And, you know, I mean, you never, you never act on this and so on, but it, but, but it somehow just having this intention makes you happy. That could, that could also happen. Um, but but that doesn't alter the fact that it has failed as an intention if uh, if you never do anything about it. Yes. The last question because we are late. Well, well, okay. Now I was wondering the cases Andrea mentioned whether we can say that. Not that they are malfunctioning beliefs, but uh, that they are not beliefs at all, and allowing states other than beliefs to, motiv to, to have a ro the role uh, uh, in uh, practical reasoning. Yeah. And that, that's a, a related to a concern I have in your idea that uh, like the central role that you assign to the integrating into practical reasoning. Because you, I think you consider the example of the scientists who integrate an assumption, but you say, okay, but there the it's, uh, the, the action is mediated by a belief that it is a good enough assumption. Yeah. But there seem to be cases where you do integrate into your practical reasonings propositions that you don't believe, but without this mediation. And maybe Andrea's cases are, and I was thinking of cases of pretense, yeah. okay. which are, at, at some theories of pretense at least, do not uh, use the mediating role of beliefs. Like children are not likely to to have a mediating beliefs. Yeah. They just have the pretense and act upon it. So, so that's, yeah. Uh, that's. Yeah. So, 
I mean, the, on the question of whether they're beliefs, I think, I mean, Pascal, you know, for example, you know, because it, Pascal's wager is, is a classic example of this. I mean, I think he really thought about this issue. And, um, and his, his view was um, that, of course, you can't, uh, you can't just switch on a belief in the existence of God, you know, simply because you realise that it's in your, that it maximises expected utility or something. But, but uh, I mean, his, his answer was, well, so, w w but once you realise that it would be good to have this belief, what you should do is, you know, spend as much time as possible hanging out with religious people and, you know, go to church and so on. And, and then there is a natural psychological mechanism which will take over that you tend to take on beliefs from uh, you know your uh, the the people in your social circle, and so you so in the long run you, you will start to quite genuinely believe in the existence of of God. But but I mean it's something that you have to achieve through a certain kind of process of self manipulation, um, and you know and in that case of course it, it's not actually pre if if you just in, in, when you're in the state when you just think it would be in my interests to believe in the existence of God, and maybe when you're kind of hypocritically, you know, uh, praying and so on, that's not going to do you any good. But uh, but uh, but the idea is eventually you, you will come to believe. Um, so it, the case, the other case you mentioned, well, sorry, the case you mentioned was was the case of of pretense, and and so it's true that. In, in certain limited ways, children do act on things that they're pretending are the case. Um, but, you know, it, it's ex it is extremely um, limited. Uh, so that, um, you know, if they're pretending that one of them is the queen, and then, you know, the queen gives orders, and, you know, within limits they'll obey. But, um, you know, as... Um, you know, if if she starts, uh, the queen starts asking them to, you know, to to give her that, you know, the, you know, their favourite toys and things. That, that then, you know, that, that then re reality will take over at some point. And um, and so uh, there are. I mean, th and I think the. I mean, the reason that we we don't want to uh, to say that that they that they really believe is because there are all these kind of checks. So I mean that that it's. Uh, this is all happening within, you know, relatively strict limits. And of course, with children, it's also the case that that uh, that they often have difficulty in in separating fact from fiction. And and so, you know, it, it's uh, it can it can happen that that belief sort of turns it turns into uh, sorry pretense turns into uh, belief. And you know, but uh, but. Sure, there are lots of cases where children are pretending without believing, but I think those are exactly the cases where the uh, the acting on um, on these things is is under these strict, you know, or, or maybe not so strict, but it's definitely under some kind of control. But uh, still, without the mediation, so they seem to treat the proposition as if they, they knew it for the duration of the game, but we don't want to ascribe to say that they are any close to believe it. So I think there is quite evidence that children have a good grasp of the difference between uh, pretense and reality. Yes. So you don't say that they are confusing insofar as they treat it in the way yeah. they are confusing. Uh, so, yeah, I don't it, know. But I mean, the th so the thing is, there... You know, supposing you know one of one of them is, um, you know, is being a bear or something, and and you know, is threatening to eat the others. I mean, they're uh, and they're so the, the children are they're running away, screaming, but but kind of very pleasurably screaming. And I mean, they're, they're not at all scared out of their wits, right? I mean, that they're but and they and they probably. And, and they will do things like, I mean, they'll run away and then stop, <laughs> in, you know, in a way that would make no sense at all if this was a real bear, where they should just keep running a, a, all the way home. Um, and, you know, I, so I think that it's, you know, I, I agree that, in, I mean, 
it's, it's not as though that all the time that they're thinking this is only a pretense. I mean, you know, they, they can get very involved in the game. But, but there are kind of, there's, there is a background understanding that's, that's mediating this, that, that is, as it were, prepare, you know, they're ready to, 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 to take over, you know, whenever needed. I mean, um, and, and I think our, our unwillingness to uh, ascribe belief in these cases very much has to do with, with the limits on the pretense. You know, and if we take away those limits, um, then, um, th then it, it, it seems like a case where they are confusing the, the game with, with reality. Um, so, you know, it, although it, it, uh, in many ways it is as we're knowledge-like behavior, I think, we, you know, we, we it just, I mean, we just, ha it has to be part of the view that, that it, it really has to be closer to, to knowledge than, you know, and because, I mean, well, just to give you the, you know, an example, I mean, suppose that it turns out that the one, you know, they're just playing at uh, one of them being a queen, but then it, it turns out that as a matter of fact, she, under to, to them, well, sorry, that's begging the question, but supposing in fact this, this child actually is the queen, <laughs> but the other children don't realise it, um, then th 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 they can't afterwards say, oh yes, I knew she was the queen all along. They didn't know that she was the queen all, all along, even if she was, because, and even though they were acting in a way that was as if they knew, but, but, they, but, but as it were, I mean, I, of course, there's more than one thing happening in this in this case. But um, it's so that there's, in some crucial way, it, it, it's it's not similar enough to to knowledge uh, to count as um, as belief. Um, I mean, the, the, there are also evidential okay, <laughs> issues no, no. Yeah, <laughs> issues yeah. there, but. Um, so, you know, so I agree. It's you know these are these are these are very good cases to think about because because they're so close without without being there. But I think it is possible to hold the line. Right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we are very late today. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, and see you tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>